give it, uh, let's give two hands together for Dr. Sandman. Thank you. Um, I, I'm hoping I can be heard. If I, if I can't, I assume somebody will tell me. Um, hear you loud I am not live from Brooklyn. I am, I am actually live from uh, the Atlantic Ocean. I'm en route from uh, uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro to Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, so I'm rocking and rolling on a ship at the moment. Um, uh, I, I'm not only the only person on this panel with no, uh, uh, you know, who isn't in the room, I'm also the only person with no research to report. Uh, I'm going to be giving you impressions uh, from a 50-year career as a risk communication consultant. Um, what that means, uh, being a risk communication consultant, is that uh, I try to... Uh, replicate in some audience the attitude toward the risk that experts are telling me or my clients' experts are telling me uh, is most commensurate with the data. So uh, if the experts say this is a serious risk, I try to get people more worried, more upset, more concerned. If the experts say it's a trivial risk, I try to calm people down. Um, uh, given that I did that for 50 years, I spent an awful lot of time with experts, uh, experts in various aspects of risk assessment. Um, uh, and uh, if you will, go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, not, not neutral experts for the most part, uh, but uh, experts that uh, believed what my client wanted the public to believe. Uh, so I had a front row seat uh, on what was behind my experts expertise other or what was behind their expert judgment other than their expert expertise. Um, uh, and, and that's what, what I really want to talk about today. Uh, what goes into an expert's expert judgment other than that expert's expertise? Um, uh, I'm going to give examples to the extent that time permits from uh, COVID, uh, but most of the points I'm going to be making uh, are generic points. Um, and again, I want to emphasize, uh, I'm giving you uh, anecdotal evidence, if you will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about what I think I've learned in 50 years of working with experts, um, but uh, I didn't do any research on those experts. Uh, and that, you know, so uh, take, take that with whatever uh, grain of salt you think is appropriate. Um, one other introductory point, uh, my comments today are going to be critical of the public health establishment and perhaps of experts in general. Uh, so I think it's important for me to say uh, that I'm on their side, they're the good guys. Um, but in large part, because they're the good guys and because they feel like the good guys and because they feel like the public should damn well know they're the good guys, they tend to be resistant to overcoming the biases that I'm about to talk about. Uh, so they're the good guys, but, you know, they're not the best at, at, at keeping their expertise narrowly expert and unbiased. Um, one, one further comment uh, uh, to the people running this event, I tend to run long. Uh, so I would be grateful if you would warn me when I've got about three minutes left. Uh, don't send me a, a, a text because I won't see it. Uh, just interrupt and say three minutes to go and I'll, I'll skip the details and, and cut to a few bottom lines. Um, okay, uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, this is my first of, of eight key points. Uh, expert opinion is mostly secondhand opinion. Outside of their narrow specialties, most experts know only the conclusions that the handful of real experts have promoted. Um, now, I think we know this if we think about it, but we don't usually think about it. Um, uh, uh, you know, a handful of people have studied some particular thing uh, for decades and they know it cold. They produce the literature. Uh, they read every study that they didn't actually write, and they and they read it carefully. Maybe they go back and look at the original data. 
Uh, but there's only a handful of them. Everybody else in the same field studied something else, some other sub topic for the last 20 or 30 years, uh, and they are secondhand experts. Uh, they haven't produced the data, they haven't examined the data. At best, they've maybe read a few of the key t the, 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 the key articles in top journals. Uh, often they've only read summaries of the literature, sometimes not even that. Uh, they just hear the scuttlebutt. Uh, from their colleagues, uh, so that you know they are distinctly secondhand experts. Uh, but of course, they're they're nonetheless promoted as experts uh, by their universities. I mean, the media get announcements saying Dr. Sandman is available uh, for interviews uh, as an expert on anything having to do with communication. Uh, uh, and that certainly happened to me when 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 I was a university professor. Uh, this this is a process that works just fine when two specs are met. Uh, one, the real experts all agree, and two, the real experts are right. Um, if the experts are wrong, of course, the secondhand experts are gonna be the last to know it. Uh, but I think more importantly, if the experts disagree, a secondhand expert may not realize that that handful of real experts do not in fact have a consensus. Uh, some of what happens is a secondhand expert knows pretty much what the experts in his or her narrow venue believe. Um, so that, for example, if the real, the real experts in the United States think that schools should be closed because of COVID, then secondhand experts think all experts believe that uh, and may not realize that over in Europe, the real experts are thinking that schools should be kept open. Um, or uh, to give another example, uh, if, if the real expert ep epidemiologists think that COVID is mostly droplets uh, and therefore social distancing uh, is important and non-medical masks are likely to be useful, um, a secondhand expert, also an epidemiologist, may think that's what all real experts believe. Uh, but in fact, experts in other fields, respiratory protection, fluid dynamics, industrial hygiene, engineering, uh, all those experts, uh, as it turned out, were disinclined to think that COVID was mostly droplets. They thought COVID was mostly aerosols. Um, and that led to very different recommendations. If it's aerosols, uh, ventilation is a lot more important and social distancing is a lot less important. Masks are a lot less likely to work unless they're N95s. Uh, but if I'm a secondhand expert, I know what the experts in my country and in my discipline believe at best. Uh, and if the experts in my country and my discipline are also in disagreement, if there's no expertise even in that narrower area, I may not know that even. Um, in short, knowledge, even expert knowledge, is a lot more communal than we normally realize. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that this is, this. you know, we, we, how do I put it? We believe falsehoods for the same reasons we believe tr truths, because people we trust have told us to believe them. Uh, you know, the, the dynamics of coming to believe something that's false and the dynamics of coming to believe something that's true are pretty much the same. In neither case are you relying on, on data. In both cases, you're relying on trust in people you believe are the experts. Uh, it, and uh, the last point I want to make about point one, which I think is important to bear in mind, is that human beings tend to lose track of this distinction between firsthand and secondhand knowledge. Uh, we absorb conclusions from sources we trust, and then we imagine that we know why those conclusions are valid. Uh, so when secondhand experts, which again, as most experts, when they tell us to trust the science, what they're really themselves trusting isn't the science. It's their secondhand impression of what they think is the consensus of a subset of real experts. So that's point number one. Next slide, please. Point number two, expert consensus is often not a genuine consensus, just a majority opinion. Uh, I think this is true for both firsthand and secondhand experts. Uh, and what happens is the minority opinions very often go underground, e either that or they're ridiculed. 
Now, I don't want to overstate this point. Lots of scientific conclusions are unanimous or nearly unanimous. If they've been much studied, uh, there may be virtually no expert disagreement. Uh, but what's interesting, I think, is what happens when there is expert disagreement. Um, and, and I think what's, what's going on there is a kind of a tipping point phenomenon. Uh, if the experts are 50-50, we're likely to know they don't agree. Uh, but at somewhere around 75 to 25, where, where the, the, it's three to one uh, on one side versus, you know, the majority versus the minority, the minority tends to go silent, uh, to go underground. Um, so what happens? Uh, experts with minority opinions uh, have trouble getting evidence, right? They, they can't get grants. Uh, their papers aren't uh, published, or if they're published, they're not in, in as, as uh, uh, high stature journals. Um, uh, experts who share those minority opinions, but maybe aren't so aggressive, uh, they see what's happening to the aggressive minority, and they see the handwriting on the wall, and they decide they'd, they'd better go into a different subfield uh, where they're not in the minority. Um, uh, those who don't see the handwriting on the wall uh, and refuse to go silent may be ostracized in the faculty lounge, uh, uh, or they may be publicly disparaged, redefined as, as not really experts at all. Uh, in some cases, of course, they are uh, these outlier experts are deplatformed. Uh, if they don't deplatform themselves by going silent, uh, and I, I, I think I assume I do not have to tell a heterodox academy audience uh, about the deplatforming of minority experts during COVID. Uh, some of it engineered by government officials at NIH, CDC, the White House, and so forth. Uh, some of it undertaken voluntarily by Facebook, Twitter, and, and other platforms. Uh, uh, so if the real experts, are, you know, the, the minority of real experts are going silent, then the secondhand experts get a misimpression. Uh, that 75-25 uh, uh, disagreement begins to look like a consensus. Um, and, of course, the 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 the. Uh, the, the Pressures uh, on the real experts are also exerted on the secondhand experts. Uh, the pressure not to not to be uh, vocal with a minority opinion. So suppose, for example, you are a, uh, a, a, a young assistant professor in a school of public health uh, in the early months of the pandemic, uh, and you've read a, probably at least a little bit about the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, what you've read is not likely, I think, to motivate you to read further. Uh, it's profoundly unlikely to motivate you to mention the Great Barrington Declaration in a TV interview uh, as an example of how the experts aren't all on the same page about whether lockdown is a good idea. Um, so the, the, the secondhand experts get a misimpression of how much consensus there is among the real experts, and the general public gets even more of a misimpression from the secondhand experts. Uh, so that that 75-25 split uh, begins to look very much like a consensus uh, to the experts. Uh, the outliers, if you can tell that there are outliers at all, look like dissidents, worse than dissidents, they look like crazies. Uh, um, and to the extent that lay people run across outlier opinions, they're likely to see those opinions branded as misinformation. Now, underlying much of what I'm saying here uh, is my view that uh, expert disagreement is normal. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that one bunch of experts is incompetent or dishonest or biased. Uh, it can just mean that the answer isn't firmly known and opinions differ and the data are uh, not dispositive. But most experts, interestingly enough, seem to think like, uh, 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 otherwise. Uh, when, inter when, and when experts are forced to acknowledge that the other side exists at all, which they try not to do, but when they're forced to acknowledge that, yeah, there is another side, they often assert pretty explicitly that the other side is incompetent or dishonest or biased. Um, it, it's, it's shockingly rare, in my experience, uh, for an expert to matter-of-factly tell, tell the public that other equally qualified experts disagree. 
Uh, when it happens, you notice it. When an expert says, well, this is my opinion, but I have colleagues with the same degrees I have and just reading the same journals I read who think something completely different. Uh, that you know, Experts don't often say that. Uh, similarly, it, it was shockingly rare uh, throughout COVID uh, how few mutually respectful debates academia fostered. Uh, you would think maybe, at least if you were naive, you might think that academia is a place where uh, experts on, on debatable issues debate those issues. Uh, uh, that certainly did not happen uh, very often with COVID. Now, in fairness, there is a contrary trend. Uh, uh, sometimes experts with minority or even outlier opinions uh, build a reputation uh, on their idiosyncratic positions. Um, uh, there's a niche for an iconoclast expert. I think it's a small niche and a dangerous niche, but but uh, yeah, I, 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 certainly talking to the Heterodox Academy, which which is in business in large measure to nurture that contrarian niche. I don't I don't want to imply that it doesn't exist, uh, but uh, I, I I think we probably can all agree that it's uh, for most people unattractive. It's uh, it's a minority taste. Uh, to be known uh, as uh, having weird opinions. Uh, I should also concede that there's a, a contrary trend to my argument that expert consensus is often manufactured. Uh, as many of you know, uh, sometimes dissensus is manufactured, uncertainty is manufactured. There, you know, there are often interest groups uh, trying, even if an issue is pretty well settled, trying to persuade the public that it is way more uh, uh, debatable than it actually is. So, so you know, there, the, the, there is an effort to manufacture consensus on the one hand. There is an effort to manufacture dissensus and uncertainty on the other hand. Uh, but, uh, you yeah, I mean, what, know, what that ends up with is the amount of expert disagreement is likely to be more than the majority claims uh, and less than the minority claims. But the majority is getting most of the public attention. So it's, it's the former bias, the understating of expert disagreement that dominates public opinion and dominates policy formation. Okay, next slide, please. Point three, uh, like a gas, expertise expands to fill the available space. If we let them, all experts will happily opine beyond their expertise. Uh, and we usually let them, and we certainly did le let them vis-a-vis -vis COVID. Uh, this is, a, I think, a very simple point, and I, I, can, I can make it uh, rather more quickly than I made the first two. Um, uh, when, when they're talking to other professionals, um, X tend to define their expertise very narrowly, deferring to somebody else in the room who, who is a firsthand expert. Uh, but as soon as experts are talking to the general public, where there is no firsthand expert in the room, uh, then uh, experts typically define their expertise much more broadly. Um, uh, as long as I know more about the question than the audience does, I'm likely to feel qualified to opine freely uh, in an interview, in an op-ed, um, um, uh, pretty much in any venue I have an opportunity to speak in. Um, that would be all right, I think, if experts were you know, sort of acknowledging that they were out of their lane. If, you know, if, if you know, I mean, it, I mean, it turns out that epidemiologists, for example, and, and virologists to take two fields, both very directly relevant to COVID, um, they have quite different expertise. Um, and, and, you know, they know a, a little bit about each other's fields, but not that much. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, for the most part, uh, if an epidemiologist starts talking virology or a virologist starts to, uh, talking epidemiology or either talks immunology or industrial hygiene or mathematical modeling or toxicology or any of the other fields uh, that are directly relevant to the sciences involved in COVID, um, they are out of their lane. Um, but they are unlikely to say so. They are unlikely to recognize that it's true, uh, and they're quite likely to be to feel justified in expressing opinions, um, expert opinions uh, on not just on topics where they're not firsthand experts, but even on topics where they're not secondhand experts, where they're not in their field. 
Um, and I think maybe that's all I need to say about that. Next slide, please. Point number four, um, uh, during, uh, during COVID, we unwisely allowed technical experts uh, to dominate decisions that desperately needed social science expertise. Um, uh, you know, epidemiologists, as I, as I say, often stray into virologists' lane and vice versa, but at least they know there's a lane there uh, that they're straying into. Not so sure social science is a lane at all. Um, now, I mean, given the replica replication crisis uh, in social science, I grant that, <laughs> that maybe they have a, a, a point. Um, but this is, after all, a panel of social scientists, so I feel reasonably safe in asserting that social science is actually a field or a, a whole bunch of fields. Psychology is a field, sociology, political science, even communication. These are squishier fields than physics. Um, they're probably even squishier fields than epidemiology and virology, but they are fields. Uh, they were not fields well represented in COVID decision making. Uh, I, I made a habit whenever there was an advisory committee or a, a decision making body of some sort of, to study the expertise of the of the people in the group, uh, and there was usually no social scientist in the group. They were all so-called hard scientists. Um, uh, and that's not because social science questions weren't uh, at stake. And I, you know, I could I could list fifty, but I will list two uh, fundamental social science questions that. Uh, and I want to say the questions weren't ignored. They were answered by amateurs. They were answered by people who had studied no social science since maybe high school history. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll name just two questions. Now, number one. Uh, of course, mandates increase compliance with pandemic precautions. You know, if you make people do things, they're likelier to do them. Um, but the question, the social science question, is how will the coercion in a mandate affect people's attitudes toward those precautions, their willingness to take them when the mandate ends, their attitude toward the government agencies behind them? Um, uh, pretty much every social scientist is familiar with the concept of reactance. Uh, the tendency of people to uh, uh, get irritated when they are coerced, and, and that irritation leads to uh, uh, kinds of resistance that are uh, measurable and indeed predictable. Um, but uh, I think COVID decisions about mandates got made by public health people, by, by uh, non-social scientists who probably never heard of reactants and certainly were not thinking hard about the difference between is it a good idea to get vaccinated and is it a good idea to make people get vaccinated? So that's one. Uh, the second one, and again, I could do I could do twenty or two hundred, but I'm only going to do two. Um, uh, an obvious social science question that was, um, I think, inadequately considered: How will closing schools for many months affect children? Um, and to what extent uh, will the loss of, 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 of social interaction in the school, to what extent will uh, uh, the, the, the being stuck home uh, with, with nobody to, to, to be with, to talk with, uh, to interact with, to what extent will, the, will there be loss of learning? To what, you know, uh, is remote learning gonna, gonna uh, do a good job of replacing in-person learning? Uh, these are questions to which social scientists have answers. Uh, sometimes debatable answers, but it, you know it, it is a field. Um, they are questions that were answered by hard scientists who knew nothing about that field. Uh, so, I mean, two pretty obvious uh, uh, implications of all of this. Uh, number one, uh, COVID outcomes might have been significantly better if social scientists had been consulted more. Um, and number two, epidemiologists and virologists and the rest of the key decision makers of uh, throughout the uh, COVID decision making um, uh, were unlikely to make optimal social science decisions. It's not that they weren't making social science decisions. They were just making ignorant social science decisions. And, and I think uh, society paid a price for that. Okay, next slide, please. We're halfway done. I don't know how we're doing on time, but I, I, we've done, I've done four out of the eight I want to cover. Uh, number five, 
uh, and it's a related but I think even bigger problem in some ways, maybe the biggest of the of the eight I want to talk about. Too often, experts assume that their technical expertise gives them policy expertise as well. Um, but policy questions, I think, are largely values questions. Uh, they are large, in large measure not scientific questions at all. They're trans-scientific. Uh, now, to some extent, of course, policy is a social science. And, and in that sense, uh, uh, point five is just a restatement of point four. Uh, when when uh, scientists decide to make uh, uh, policy decisions, um, they are maybe you know, in, in making social science decisions. But I think it goes beyond that. I mean, I, I think uh, social science is the study of policy, but it's, it's it, you know, it, it, to actually decide what should we do. I mean, social scientists uh, study what's likely to happen if we do X. Um, uh, the question of should we do X is not just a, a social science question, it is a values question. Uh, and uh, I, I think what, what's incredible here uh, is that technical experts uh, in, in, in public health and in most other fields as well, technical experts not only allied from their expertise to other people's expertise, they not only allied from their expertise to other people's expertise to social science expertise, they allied from all those kinds of expertise to uh, values questions that aren't about expertise at all, that are about ideology, that are about uh, ethics and 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 uh, topics uh, about which none of us uh, has a right to pull rank uh, as an expert. Now, of course, a technical expert's technical opinions, if they follow logically, uh, if they lead logically Peter, to a Peter, policy position. This is your three-minute yes, warning. Your three-minute warning. My th All right, I got to hurry up. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, what, what, what's most, what's most central here, uh, is, is, uh, technical people, uh, went to value judgments. Um, they, they made value judgments. Uh, they defended those value judgments routinely as if they were expert opinions. Uh, so, you know, if you're trying to decide whether we should, uh, uh give people booster shots or not, and you haven't got good data yet, uh, uh, one of the things you're considering is, is, you know, should we, should we move without good data or should we wait till we have better data? That's a values question. Uh, people are pressing for boosters. So one of the things you're considering is should we give in to pressure or should we de uh, not defer to pressure? That's a values question. So values questions were contaminating uh, 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 you know, we're, we're dominating a lot of decisions about COVID, but they weren't represented as values questions. They were, they were represented as, as technical questions. Uh, and we could go on and on. Uh, uh, the origin of, of COVID, did it, did it start in an animal market or in a lab? The effectiveness of masks and of mask mandates. Uh, what happens with questions like that is if, if you're, if you're, if you're on one side, you look at a study and you find that study very persuasive. If you're on the other side, you find the same study uh, uh, full of methodological flaws. Uh, so you you know you you cherry pick among the studies the ones that support your values. Uh, you represent yourself and maybe actually believe that you're standing tall for the data, but what you're actually standing tall for is your prior opinion, is your values. Uh, okay, we're going to have to move on. Next, next slide, please. Uh, insofar as experts' values are political, uh, they are far likelier to lean left than right. Um, that's partly because academia is mostly a left-leaning enterprise. It's also partly, I think, because public health is mostly a left-leaning enterprise. Uh, uh, you know, for reasons that I, I wish I, I wish I had time to go into. Uh, so public health made lots of decisions that were more upsetting to the right than they were to the left. Uh, and I'll list just a few of them. Uh, excoriating anti-lockdown demonstrations as super spreader events and then giving George Floyd demonstrations against police violence or free pass. 
uh, proposing that young people of color were a higher priority target for scarce vaccine doses than elderly white people, shutting down churches during lockdowns is inessential while keeping liquor stores open, uh, delaying the vaccine rollout until after election day, so uh, at least in part, so Donald Trump couldn't have an October victory lap, uh, deferring to teachers' unions and decision-making about whether and when to reopen schools. These were all decisions that were not only arguable and, and arguably not, uh, uh, not widely trusted, or at least not universally trusted, they were left-leaning decisions uh, that alienated the right far more than the left. Okay, Peter. Uh, next slide, please. Peter, we'll have to we'll have to uh, stop here so we can All move on to the next presentation. All right, let me let me just say what number seven and number eight are. Uh, uh, number seven is is that the uh, uh, public health prioritizes uh, uh, health over anything else, over economics, education, and even liberty. Uh, and number eight is that public health also prioritizes health over truth. Uh, faced with a choice between telling you the full truth and telling you something that will get you to do what I think is good for your health, most public health people choose, if not actually a lie, if not actually a noble lie, uh, at least uh, a, a, a misleading distortion of the full truth in the service of health. Uh, next and last slide, just so you can see them all at once. There they are. Uh, those are, in my judgment, uh, a great deal of what happens in academia uh, all the time, not just with COVID, and certainly what happened vis-a-vis -vis COVID. And I will, I will uh, belatedly stop there. Thank you, Peter.